writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio on probably one of our most um, interesting topics. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, crime drama, and a lot of other crazy stuff, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. And this week we have my happy co-host. Kathleen Kayembe, writer of Paranormal Romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, wearing <coughs> shirts and interested in this conversation. Thank you for wearing shirts. I usually do, but sometimes <laughs> there are dresses involved. Okay, that's what you find too. Go ahead, you start. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now I jumped in. I'm Brad R. <laughs> Cook. Uh, I write historical fantasy more known as steampunk. Check out The Iron Horseman. It is out now. Uh, and Iron Zulu will be dropping soon, so uh, pre-order it and love it as much as I do. Fedora Amos, I'm president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, and I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and soon to come Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West. <laughs> I'm Mel Claney, author of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. Lee Savage, author of Erotic Paranormal Romance, uh, Normal Erotic Romance, and under the name Carrie Lee Williams. I also have a couple of children's books, all on Amazon.com. My name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. And today we are going to talk about religion in fiction. Boo hiss. <laughs> <laughs> Fedora has joined us out of pure um, Because she's pro- trapped in the corner and there's two people sitting between <laughs> her and the door. Oh, yeah, they will let her out. <laughs> she's here under protest. Yes. Just to, then we just are to not make think- a note, Fedora's already salty and we haven't even started talking yet. <laughs> <laughs> and we are not talking about religious fiction. We are not talking about... Um, religion and politics. We're talking about where religion shows up, either fictional religion, past religions, or even contemporary religions show up in stories and how they are, how they should be treated or how they can be treated. And how they so, can be used to make your story more complicated. You're right. Plot, or r- better, richer. <laughs> and I'm going to start off just with, um, I'm going to steal a little bit, Kathleen. I'm going to turn it over to her for, for this. <laughs> We're going to start off actually with a science fiction episode of Babylon 5. Yay! Which several of us around here are fans of. Um, it was a first season episode where it was dealing with religion in fiction. And by the way, in Babylon 5, religion comes up quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, Particularly Mimbari religion. Yes. Well, that's because they're outspoken and, about And <laughs> Narn religion. Oh, yeah. They had a couple Big episodes. Time. But let's, let's but talk about the human religion. they well into the plot and they enrich the characters. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons David brought up this particular episode is all the aliens on this spaceship. What? It's not a spaceship, it's a space station. Thank Same you, thing. Semantics Girl. <laughs> all the aliens on this space station were having a basically present your own religion day. So all the other aliens had gone kind of thing, and the human captain of the space station was freaking out because... There are so many religions on Earth, there's no one dominant religion. And he was like, what do I present to these people as representative of Earth? So at the end of the episode, he takes all the alien ambassadors to the beginning of a long line that goes beyond what the camera can see. It's a long line of humans. And he introduces the first one. Yeah, I forget which in the order it was, but uh, introduces um, to a Roman Catholic, to an Orthodox Jew, to a Muslim, to a Hindu to somebody out of Native American religion and Shintoism, and it kept going. He keeps going, and these are the representatives of Earth religion. And Mm -hmm. looking at that, I was like, there is so much we can choose from. Why do we not have more religion in our fiction when that's such a big part of our world in so many ways? And it's something that most humans come into contact with in some form or another. Why are we not then putting it into our fiction, even though it makes things complicated? Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, And the reason I say this is because it actually is my biggest pet peeve in all of science fiction. 
Uh, Star Trek is horrible with it. Babylon 5 is not very good with it. I could keep going. I've never understood why every alien race has one religion. <laughs> no. And if they have two religions, it's the dominant religion and those rebels we're going to kill in this episode. <laughs> so, my biggest problem is here on Earth, we have a variety of religions. We literally have hundreds of religions. And for some reason, the entire rest of the universe is one religion per planet. And it dominates everything, and there is no ability to choose, there is no ability to have any kind of other thing. I mean, we have three religions that basically say all the same things, and, you know, all are worshipping yeah. the same people, and all this other kind of stuff, but, you know, they come at it from different directions, and they don't agree with each other or whatever. But you won't even find that on an alien planet. <laughs> You're literally just going to find the Klingons have theirs, uh -huh. uh, you know, the Mimbari have theirs, um, you know, and, and theirs, yeah. you move on from there. And I've never understood why you can't have 30 religions per planet other than, as a sci-fi writer, it's way easier to just give them that one religion and move on. No, wait a minute. Lazy writers. It's been too long since I've seen Babylon 5, but didn't the Narn have a bunch of different religions? They did. No. They, uh, they all follow different prophets. Yeah. Right. So, and uh, Nathoth didn't follow any, and Jakar kept trying to, to push his agenda on her, which I thought was pretty great. <laughs> and you're right, the Alpha, the, the Centauri actually has separate gods as well. The Centauri have like 500-something yes. gods. <laughs> yeah, but is that the Centauri religion? Or is our, you know, they They're actually just, uh, broken up. I mean, the Egyptians had hundreds of gods. I was literally thinking of exactly. the Egyptians and then the Greeks and the Romans. Yeah, like, that's, mm -hmm. that's the Centauri. But we, we <laughs> still break them up. That's the, you know, the Egyptians yeah, had their gods and the Greeks had their gods. Even they though there's a lot of overlapping between, mm -hmm. you know, some of the ancient gods. Yeah, well, the, the Centauri are given a whole lot of uh, Egyptian and Roman and Greek um, everything. Mm -hmm. And England as well. Because they are imperialism people. So they're given a pantheon of multiple gods to sort of liken them to those Earth uh, counterparts. Also, I might mention that the, their gods are ridiculous, and they, they've got a god for absolutely everything, and m some of the gods are actually their uh, emperors that have ascended much in the same way that the pharaohs do. And the Romans did for a while, too. Mm-hmm. God emperor. Yeah. God Emperor of Dune was turn ourselves into a half a sandworm. <laughs> that, that was God Emperor. Yeah. yeah. I love, I, you know, you don't have a video of Kathleen's face right now. That was hilarious. Yeah, God Emperor of Dune. He, was, yeah. he actually That's became the most terrible Shai ascension Halud. bonus I have ever heard. Mm -hmm. Be a god, you could turn into a sandworm, but only half. <laughs> I didn't want to know then, which he half. He kept evolving into more and more sandworm as he went. It's actually, he started out full human and kept progressing to be more and more sandworm. That's, that sounds yeah. really awkward transition. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds like a hugely complicated process. and It took a, hundreds of years. <laughs> see, but that's, that's a religion in fiction. Like, mm -hmm. he becomes a god. They kill sandworms, don't they? No. Oh, they killed the baby ones well, they killed to make the, the water of life. That's a different story. But the water generally okay. speaking, they didn't want to kill sandworms. But, like, that's a huge series, okay. and that's a pretty big thing to play into it. <laughs> and I'm guessing, I'm guessing that religion was not shied away from because of how political those books are. No. No, I mean, no. The whole point. I mean, that's the whole point of the Kwisak Haderach. <laughs> who is the supreme being and the one god who is the one prophet who might be uh, exactly like several prophets on this planet. And but way, except sidebar, it was his son side, that was the god emperor of Dune. Sidebar, yes. if you decide to listen to this episode as a drinking game, every time you, every time <laughs> every you time, hear yes. Brad or one of us say, quiz that hag rack, feel free to drink. drink. Fedora wants a drink now. <laughs> 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 she wants a double. I'm just gonna throw it out, Quizax Hatterack, just in, yeah, so you can take another drink. <laughs> oh, she's counting. Um, so, what? Since we're talking about a specific book now, what what books have done religion well? Well, okay, you want you can actually break that down in a couple of ways. I'm gonna call it real religions in the sense that they have or currently exist today in this world. And they're and not made up by the author for that. They're not book. made up by the author. Or you can talk about ones in which have been completely made up by the author, yeah. such as the quiz at Hatterack. Take another drink. <laughs> um, the Jedi. There's another one. The entire of the Force. In Star the Wars. Jedi. In Star yeah. Wars. The Force, that whole entire good yeah, versus that's a, evil. That's a religion. Is the a Force religion. is a religion. Sorry, and they've actually I created a real religion based on that. I have. 
Oh, oh, dang. oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm sitting next to him. Okay. High school. That that was was if I had a lightsaber, I'd be like, yo. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. I'd We're talking like, about. You strike me down, I'll hand- come back stronger than you can even Handled imagine. by George Lucas or not handled by the rest of everyone else? <laughs> I mean, anyway, but if you're talking about like real religion, in, in as I defined it a moment ago, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite characters out there, Brother Catfell, the entire series, which is written in the. written modern day, but the story takes place during one of the many civil wars in England during the medieval times. Cadfell had been a soldier, left that to become a monk and a healer. And he was an everyday person. He wasn't the stick your nose to the grindstone and do exactly what the priest tells you to do, because he's like, that's not, that's not what was being taught. Well, I would actually throw out, if we're talking about books that have done religion... Mm-hmm. I, I can't guarantee well, but <laughs> no, uh, the Percy Jackson series, very good one. Uh, you know, is is completely. I mean, you know, they're not. I mean, they do play with the actual gods, but it, they're more playing with the children of the gods. But they're still playing with the gods, the Greek gods. I mean, you know, they're running all throughout the books. Uh, so that that would be you know one that is commercially successful that has truly done religion, and they kind of pull it in. Uh, you know, like what each god means, how they affect the world, what they do. Acknowledging that there's a, a spiritual realm sort of higher power thing going on yeah. and letting that be a part of the world that it exists in and not some separate bit. Like acknowledging that it's because that exists, it then affects the world that we all live in. I think one of the interesting things about the Percy Jackson series, which is internally consistent mm-hmm. um, and which does some things with the Greco-Roman pantheon that I don't approve of, <laughs> mainly because of the, the people I like most in the pantheon. <laughs> so I'll admit some bias there. But one of the things that I think is really cool is it deals with the children of these gods, and it turns their, their worldviews upside down, because, you know, the deadbeat dad you always thought you had that you never met turns out to be, you know... Neptune. Oh my god. Like, he's helping run the universe, and no wonder those weird things happen to me when I'm around, like, water for Percy. (laughs) For example, for Percy. But what does that do to your head when you find out, oh, I'm a demigod? What do you believe about the world after that? That's a good question. If you're uh, Hercules from the Disney cartoon, you scream and run. (laughs) Actually, that was pretty common. I mean, uh, if you even go back to the Greek myths... Uh, Perseus doesn't exactly take the news well when he finds out that he's, you know... Uh, Hercules is horrific whenever he finds out and has to talk to gods or Hera comes around or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, well, he and Hera didn't exactly get along. Yeah. That too, but I mean, in any of the Greek myths, nobody's like, sweet, I'm the son of a god. They're all like, oh, crap, I'm the son of a god. Oh, no. What's to be expected of me now? Yeah, so, you know, it was always played with that it was kind of a double-edged sword. I think, the, didn't the Norse do that as well? Uh, of, of course, because you've got Loki. Yes. <laughs> who is the son of, you know, Odin, sort of. Uh, they you know. handle him well, though, in the in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. They do. like They break him quite distinctly from his Nordic origins. Yes. So. Mm-hmm. He doesn't get to become a horse in the Cinematic Universe. Or a lady. <laughs> or a lady. Was it, <laughs> was it Sigurd who saved, who saved the lit Bromhilda? I don't from, the, from the Circle of Fire? Oh, boy. Okay, anyway, sorry. I'm thinking, and, and he was a demigod. Anyway, we got... Expecting me to yeah, pull out um, stuff I didn't learn since high school. <laughs> you uh, learned that in high school? The same, the same mythology feeds into the Lord of the Rings. Yes. Mm. Speaking was, of religion... <laughs> the Silver really in a chew. Um, Maggie Shane, uh, most of her books deal with pagan religion in some form. Um, and I think she does a good job of not pushing it down your throat, but giving you some facts and kind of putting it through because her, all her characters are usually pagan, so she does a very well job of intertwining that into her stories. This is not um, an all-the-way-through-the-book sort of thing, but in the Mercy Thompson series by Patricia Briggs, um, which is a, an urban fantasy story, um, there is a woman, the main character, Mercy, mm-hmm. who wears a lamb necklace around her neck, and there are vampires in this world where she is, and she goes basically into a vampire coven stronghold type place, and they check her for weapons that can hurt them, and they check her for crosses, but they leave the necklace on because she's wearing a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Who even cares? That's that's benign. It's not going to hurt anything. 
So later on in this place, the head vampire tries to attack her and the sheep starts glowing and it is repelling this vampire. She's like, Lamb of God. (laughs) (laughs) So her religion, so you know her religion there and it plays in as a plot point and it's pretty cool. So I thought that was a cool use of religion because it's not something you would expect. You expect crosses and garlic because that's what vampires do things. If I were a vampire, I would be pissed off. <laughs> yeah, they were. They were so mad. It was great. That's so stupid. <laughs> you checked her. <laughs> actually, piggybacking on what Lee said, I actually think that the pagans generally get the shaft when it comes to the true depictions of their religion. Oh yeah, no one respects the I mean, if you think about the way that most witches are portrayed, it's a horrible representation of what actual Wiccan or Wicca or any of the pagan religions are. Druids are horrendously portrayed in most (laughs) fiction and most movies and stuff That reminded me, I guess I need to talk to someone. I was curious about finding out more about that to put some possible Druid things in my (laughs) stories. Does anyone know any Druids? (laughs) (laughs) Leave a comment. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the kind of thing, and I was going to throw out. Yeah, we're you know we're talking about this and going to something that's completely fictional. Uh, I actually think this can turn bad on people. Uh, if you watch DS Nine, <laughs> I'm so sick of the Bajoran religion. I'm already sick. Out I'm of only that. three seasons in. Thank you. <laughs> Kai Wynn needed to be slapped like crazy. Uh, and in for, for yes. those of us out of the know. Please explain. Okay, so on DS9, it's, you know, space station sitting out in the middle of, you know, on the edge of space. Uh, They had a planet below them, the Bajorans, and uh, the Bajorans had a a very uh, fervent religion that Uh everyone had to follow, and it was very strict, with very strict rules, and everything that kind of goes along with that. It was one of those religion governments. Yeah. Theocracy. It's a theocracy. It's very much a theocracy and ruled by, and that was their point. I mean, they they were trying to display that. But the problem becomes not in the early seasons. You know, when you have Kira, like, oh, doubting herself. Oh, sorry. Figuring stuff out. Kira's, you know, one of the Bajorans on the station. But the point is, is that you get into later episodes. And as, you know, Jen just said, she's three seasons in and is sick to hell of it. Well, (laughs) it keeps going and it doesn't get any better. And we just keep pounding this nail into the last coffin of the Bajoran religion. The last episode. So deals extensively with the Bajoran religion. I'll have to look forward. So to it's it's <laughs> just, it's one of those things that just does not but, stop, and it, it gets to the point where the original point, what they originally were trying to go for, and the entire point of why they started it, gets lost and gets used for fodder and and everything else, and story plots and story mm-hmm. arcs and everything that comes along with it, to the point where it's overused. And I think that it's a great example if you're wanting to write religion in fiction. Uh, Things to avoid. Uh, Let example. me point out something about Deep Space Nine, just to let you know how central the Bajoran religion is to the plot. Captain Sisko, well, actually, he starts out as Commander Sisko and he gets a promotion to Captain Sisko. Guess what? He's a demigod to yeah. the Bajoran religion. Yeah, he, yeah. Gets, he gets promoted. Up that the would be one of those points when it starts to get a little. <sighs> no, but that happens right at the beginning, and then later we find yeah. out that he really. Okay, so originally Starfleet. Let's not spoil spoil it. Oh, oh, spoiler. Spoiler. It's not, I'm only in season three. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, spoilers. Yeah, you're going down a spoiler alert. That's why I actually did not go there. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's not a spoiler because what? this is found out right away that he's a yeah, demigod. Yeah, the demigod thing, but how it right. turns so, and gets yeah. ugly in the. Topic. So, um, one of the things that I've seen Megan Durr, who writes um, gay romance, well, MM romance, with Less Than Three Press, one of the things I think she does very well is curses. And this is a religious topic for me, um, specifically because there are certain ways that people curse or say, like, or swear that are common across different, across cultures. Like, you say something about the mom say something about the gods, Mm -hmm. you say something about, you know, the bad gods, you know, you say something about fecal matter. (laughs) All right. Those things. Generally something for everything. And in a world with a religion that is something you have created, I've noticed that Megan Durr always has cool curses that would make sense given the gods that her people believe in, in in a given story, or what their culture finds important. So... Even little things like that, I think, are good ways of bringing religion into a story that are completely natural. Like, you don't have to go into what everybody believes necessarily, but just the way we 
do daily things, it it's effect, it's affects us. It affects us. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of examples that have treated relig done religion well. Both are fictional. One, one, the entire series, both the original and the reboot, this is for television, um, was written for, is based on the Mormons, which is Battlestar Galactica. Ah, oh, Battlestar. And it's I like the reboot better so in the are. handling of religion. So you've are. got the Pantheon Greek-style religion. You've got the angels, which, lack of a better word, what we're going to call them. And then you've got the Cylons believing in one gun. You see a fight going on between the religions. Mm -hmm. um, and a fight for survival of all the species. Then number two, and I doubt anybody around here, so maybe Jen hmm. has watched this, and I don't, I'm not going to guarantee she did, a Japanese anime f fantasy called Record of Lodos War. I know, oh, yeah. I haven't seen yeah. it. Okay, yeah, i got a couple people who have seen it. Okay. I've seen it. <laughs> and really, that religion is more in the background of it, but it handles it correctly. It's, it's, I say correctly as in it makes it a believable type of world. It's a world-building world element. Yes. I would apply it to historical fiction, because when you write historical fiction, you have to know what was there at the time. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about St. Louis at the end of the 1800s, for example, you would know that there were a lot of German Lutherans here, mm -hmm. a lot of Irish and Italian Catholics here, mm -hmm. and that the Baptists and the Methodists were the ones who had come in in the 1700s to create uh, Protestant churches here. So mm -hmm. those were the kinds of religions groups that were available, and everybody belonged to one or the other, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And had that particular mindset. So you have to understand it as a part of the mindset of your characters. And the daily life interacts with it in a way that it would have then. So you have to be aware of that if you're going to write anything historical. And adding to that, and being of a child of parents that were of different religions, both Christian, but different religions, and at the time, what you're talking about, but later, I mean, there there was a still a Your hatred, if you will, between certain aspects of religion. So, in the his, in history wise, we they were not as liberal as we are today in the crossing over of different Christian sects. So, yeah, something to definitely play with and think of. And I'm gonna jump over there, and then I'm gonna jump back to something else. Go ahead. That reminded me of Sundays and and going to church on Sundays and how that used to, I think, be more. Prevalent? Mm -hmm. Oh, and blue laws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what are blue laws? Yeah, what's a blue law? Things oh, wow. are closed. You guys don't even know. <laughs> Things are closed. <laughs> yeah, uh, blue laws are no, basically so moral true. laws. <laughs> yeah, the blue laws were all the moral laws, which meant that you couldn't sell liquor or cigarettes on Sundays, uh, which would mean that you'd go into the grocery store and they'd literally have chains over the aisle to prevent you from even walking down the like. By the way, over they weren't open at all. Yeah, so go back some stores, yeah. 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 Some and the uh, World's Fair that we're all so proud of. It was closed every Sunday. Yep. Mm. I never knew that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that helps me with the story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have some people who aren't going to church that day. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to crash a fair. Ooh, that's fun. I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to turn mm -hmm. over to Lee. Talk about historical fiction and history. I'm going to go with the television show Vikings. I thought it handled the Norse mythology or the Norse religion because it's religion to them quite well. And some things which even have taught me, I have to go back and do research. I'm going to go on to a different uh, thing. TV show, very popular, Supernatural. Mm. Okay. They maybe yeah. took a new twist on it. Angels were not so nice. <laughs> but they still did it in a great way. Sometimes the demons were better than the angels. You just had to pick and choose, but they did it in a way that it entertained you and fed to the stories. Yeah, there's actually a lot of that, like Constantine, the prophecy, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. I love the way that they've played with the angelic universe. But jumping back to the Vikings thing, mm -hmm. uh, someone who I thought actually touched religion beautifully is uh, Eaters of the Dead by yes. Michael Crichton, yes. which touches on... A pagan religion uh, with the, the bear people. Mm -hmm. It touches on the Norse religions with the Vikings. And then it touches on the uh, Islam. Islam and the Arabic, you know, kind mm -hmm. of religion uh, through uh, Eben, 
So, you know, he, he really does kind of show you these different religions, how they act, how they affect their societies, how they affect the people within those societies, and then, you know, the, the kind of need to understand and respect other cultures' religions. It's a fascinating, great read. Mm. Uh, if you want to watch the movie, it's The Thirteenth Warrior. Yes. <laughs> well, I actually have two things going in completely different directions, just because it diver- deserves a mention. David Eddings handles religion in a lot of his books, and uh, let's see, it's I, it's not really my favorite one, but it's one I've read most recently. His, uh, even though I've read it most recently, uh, The Pawn of Prophecy is the first one of it, The Bel- Belgariad. But in that one, there are seven or eight gods in the universe, and everybody knows all the gods are real. So it's not an issue of you're the only true god, but each peoples follow their own god. And uh, again, religion is a huge part of that. But different direction, there are some stories that religion is part of it, but a much smaller part of it. So like, for instance, the godfather. Certain central themes, uh, scenes take place, you know, at the son's uh, confirmation or the christening Mm -hmm. or somebody's wedding, which is another religious thing. Um, And I was thinking Little House on the Prairie. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm pretty sure they got wrong historically, at least on how people handled it, Mm -hmm. Nellie Olson married a Jew. And everybody took that way too well, given the time (laughs) period. Let's just say that. Uh (laughs) Um, Oh, oh. That reminded me of Fiddler on the Roof, when uh, the the three daughters want to marry a Jewish guy the dad doesn't necessarily like, a uh, German, a Russian, a Russian, yeah, and a Nazi. He was a Nazi, right? One of well, them? he was a, he was a Christian. That was what was really wrong with him. Not so much that he was a not he wasn't necessarily a Nazi. This was before World War Two. Okay, pretty Nazi. I thought World War Two was coming up. It was yeah. coming up, but it was before World War Two. Anyway, okay, go so wanted to marry these three different people and the dad's like well on the one hand on the other hand and he eventually lets first two marry the third one he's like there is no other hand so that was but, pretty cool but she goes off and she converts anyway <laughs> but um i he's a revolutionary mm-hmm. <clears throat> i uh i wanted to talk about a movie that did religion poorly <laughs> mainly because i took exception to it and i wanted to like the movie <laughs> It's Legion, which is a uh, yeah. demonic possession movie where people are basically turned into demonic zombie creatures and there's a last stand at this diner. It mm-hmm. it takes inspiration, very loose inspiration from Christianity, and then I don't know what happened. <laughs> and when Brad brought up the um, the whole Wiccan religions, all the these pagan religions are being used in stories mm-hmm. in a in a very loose, maybe inspired kind of sort of way. Um, I think there are good ways of doing that, and I think there are bad ways of doing that. And this one happened to do it badly. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to use a real religion, try or, to pay um, attention to A religion to what that people doing. actually have faith in on the planet Earth. Yes. <laughs> uh, in the current day and age. Yes. Try to... Uh, Treat it with respect. You should treat it with respect. Try not to break the religious canon too much. And, uh, yeah, if you're going to make a good story, make a good story. But if you need to make something up, just just do that instead of, you know, I don't know. It hurt me inside. I was like, <laughs> I was like you're telling me these people, these zombie evil people cursing all the time are angels? These are angels. This is a demonic possession. Mm-hmm. So that broke the movie for me, like, right off the bat. I was just like, oh, sweetie, no. Mm-hmm. So don't make your readers say, oh, sweetie, no. <laughs> just don't do it. All right, I'm going to throw out one of my favorites who actually does it really well. And they actually, uh, they, they take inspiration from the past and twisted it to do their own thing. But it's the Dragonlance Chronicles, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the TSR mm-hmm. novels. That's for those clapping. of you who don't know... Uh, it is. Uh, it, it came out of the TSR Dungeons and Dragons world, but it's a totally separate world. It was written by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Yes. Um, it is a series of novels, but they have a pantheon of gods running through. Uh, and do not yell at me for my pronunciations, because I hate the real ones. Uh, <laughs> Paladin and Tachesis are the male and female deities that are constantly at war throughout the books. Um, 
She is a multi-headed dragon, straight from Tiamat, and, you know, of, you know, kind uh, of... Babylonian or... or yeah, Sumerian it's the Babylonian. And, uh, and then he has taken uh, the white-bearded, you know, old man approach that Christianity seems to have kind of... Uh, kind of like Murdoch from the same thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So the, these two, but then out of that, there are, like the Greeks, you know, kind of a pantheon of gods. Uh, the moons have effects on the gods' power, and all of this comes down to the priests, who are a class in the books running through, who are directly empowered by their gods, uh, you know, through medallions and other stuff like this. So it's, yes, it's a, it's a twist, and it's made fanciful and everything like that. It's inspired by ancient religions, uh, pulled forward, and, but it's really integrated into the book, and to the point where... These are characters in the book, and I love that. I love when the gods aren't these on-high things that sit up there but get down and dirty in the world and move around and interact and do all that kind of fun stuff where you treat them like characters. It's a fun thing you can do with religion in Fisbin. fiction. Fisbin. Fisbin. Ah, oh, Fisbin. Who did not love Fisbin? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think it's all well and good to talk about ancient religions because nobody is going to get offended. Exactly. But... Religion today is very controversial. Very Just so. ask Solomon Rushdie and his satanic <laughs> verses. You can get into a whole lot of hot water, and you have to be very careful. I think it's, if you're going to use any present religion, and anything else is not terribly relevant, let's get down to it, it's a character. If you're going to use any present one, that it, somebody is going to identify it as their own, regardless of what you meant or what you thought you were doing. Uh -huh. So I think it's very dangerous territory to enter, and I'd be really, really, really careful about it. And that's why I didn't even want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to tie in, and I'm going, going right to you. There is a, and I'm going to butcher his name, and I apologize to Native America for that. Um, oh, all, all Native, Native Americans. All Native Americans. All Native Americans. originating uh, in America. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about, in, call it indigenous. And whatever term you want to use, you know who I'm talking about. They had a prophet um, back, you know, basically at the time of the ghost dance. Um, his name, and this is the one I'm going to butcher, is Wabasha. Or Wabasha. I've never heard him pronounced correctly, so I don't know who the exact thing, but talking about that, this is the way I treat religions in my books, is by his philosophy, which is, we hold with respect everything that others consider to be sacred, for no one religion has all the truth, but all religions are based on the truth. And that, treat it with respect. Go for it. Mm -hmm. well, that's a tricky line I'm trying to walk mm -hmm. in the novel I'm writing which uses <coughs> witchcraft and also uses angels and demons because there are plenty of people that believe plenty of things about those things and I know that some of what I'm doing or much of what I'm doing requires them for the plot but is not going to be accurate toward religions that have these beings in them mm -hmm. so I'm like, do I, do I write a disclaimer? Like, one of the things I, I want to address at some point in the story is that the witchcraft being used is different from what is being, you know, what is believed in by many pagan cultures. Like, the whole system of magic is not part of any religion necessarily. It's just seen differently by different people. So that's one of the ways I'm trying to, to get around that little problem of, you know, how do you use these things in a story without trampling on the religions you're drawing from and that believe in these things. We're making a mistake that you don't intend to make. Well, I'm going to take us back to that episode, Babylon 5. That was uh, the whole plot, the overarching five seasons and a couple movies plot of Babylon 5 had a lot to do with the, the sentient universe and and what godlike powers were warring over what, and the first ones who came before us, and what are the origins of life, and these kind of things. These are all very science fiction-y uh, topics that they're approaching in the show. But, because we had that season one episode in which the show itself looked into the audience and said, your beliefs 
are are considered the same, you know, with the same validation as everything we're going to present to you going forward. And I'm like you, sometimes I get just a little bit peeved when my science fiction tells me I'm an idiot for believing that there's a spiritual realm. Uh, and I, I felt a little bit peeved watching Battlestar Galactica, to be perfectly honest, when I was looking at the monotheistic religion and sort of relating it to my own, like Fedora said. doesn't matter if it's fake, if it looks a lot like what you're looking at, you start to feel a little bit itchy on it. Uh, but I didn't get that feeling in Babylon 5, because I had a moment at the beginning where I knew, oh, well, he isn't trying to push my political, you know, his political view on me, because, you know, I know that... Um, uh, J. Michael Straczynski is an atheist, so he's not trying to push his atheistic view on me by saying that, oh, well, this is what religion really is. He's saying, oh, you have a religion, lots of people have religions, this is the Babylon 5 religion, explore it with me. It's like, oh, okay, cool. I don't feel like I've been attacked. And it had everything to do with that moment of respect at the very, very beginning. Then he could do whatever he kind of really wanted. Maybe one of the reasons I did not appreciate Legion to the extent that I wanted was it didn't have that. Hmm. Because Constantine, the film, I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's using my religion, but twisting it for story. But I did not feel like it was doing anything... It, I did not feel attacked. I mm -hmm. felt like, okay, this is the world that you're presenting. We'll go on an epic adventure together. Yeah. Well... To that end, uh, I think part of the reason for that is, in Constantine, even though they're twisting it and playing with it, at its heart, there's a reverence for that material. In Legion, <laughs> that was not the case. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think that, as David was saying earlier, that is the key, and it doesn't matter which religion you pick, so long as you treat the source material with respect. I want to real quick jump in. Great example... Uh, Kevin Smith's movie Dogma. Oh, love that <laughs> that yes. movie is straight up making fun of Catholicism for a lot of it, but Kevin Smith went to a Catholic school, and he's making fun of stuff that you can tell he knows a lot about. Mm -hmm. And it didn't offend me, and I, I, I'm sure it offended some Catholics who are a little bit touchy. Actually, it offended a lot of Catholics. Lot of Catholics. <laughs> yeah. But I, should I not thought have, because it was a hilarious movie. But it was, I love that movie uh, so a whole good. lot. I actually think it offended a lot of Baptists and a lot of Protestants more than Catholics because some of the things that the Catholics understood, like the Metatron, uh -huh. going to Baptist, uh, going to a Southern Baptist. I never heard of him. <laughs> you know, come on, that was another part of the heresy for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to talk about creating, like, world building, when you're world building, and how mm -hmm. to put religion into that. Like, how do you create a fictional religion when you're world building, well, when you know that it's not going to be central to the plot? Like, do you even bother at that point? Is it still necessary? Let's do a little round robin. Who yeah. who at the table has uh, conjured a a fantasy religion for your work? Uh, we can't see a show of hands on the radio. <laughs> yeah, no, about no, half no, of no, us. No, <laughs> it's no, like five, a, out a, yeah. uh, five out of seven of us have uh, have created a a book specific religion or mm -hmm. a world specific religion for our pieces. Let me ask a question along those lines too. How many of us have played with religion? Played is not the proper word. But <laughs> Well, respect it. How many of us? Have, how many of us in any books we have worked on or are currently working on have a religion that's real, that's not your current religion? Here, uh, I do. Can I, can I jump in on this real quick? Because I don't. Five of us. Yeah. Okay. So Iron Horseman, I'm taking it out now because that does not play with religion. I specifically kind of left religion out. Uh -huh. um, however, I have written multiple books, and I have done. I was talking earlier about the Dragonlance books. Uh -huh. uh, that was kind of my first inspiration. So, uh, one of my first novels, uh, the big giant epic that might actually come out now, <laughs> um, actually has that similar pantheon of gods. I created it entirely my own, each god. Literally, I've got pages on each god and each religion, and I went really nuts to the point where I created basically uh, seven religions for the land. And the reason I did that is also partly on that Star Trek effect of there isn't just one religion in the land kind of thing. Um, and then I've also created stories that directly play off of uh, the angels and, you know, kind of that Christian mythology mm -hmm. uh, to the point, because, you know, 
I, I love the notion of winged people. I, mm-hmm. I don't know why. I just think that's cool. So, you know, I wanted to kind of play with that and and kind of incorporate all of that. So I've written those stories too, and I, I think, to be honest. There's a lot of every religion of Earth in the religions that I have wholeheartedly just created. Mm-hmm. Um, and partly that's done because, you know, you we have source material and I'm going to kind of go to that when I need it. However, it is also fun when there's a set of rules there and you get to play with that. Uh, I'm going to throw it out anyway, even though we said we weren't. But Dan Brown, <laughs> Uh, no. You know, he took a set uh, that is there, and he uh, he spun it, and now it's actually canon, which is a little strange. <laughs> um, but, you know, <laughs> well, hey, there are people who still wholeheartedly believe that the Priory of Zion is a real thing. Uh, so, you know, it's it's just, that's, that's kind of the way it works. So you can do both. Uh, there's two different ways of doing it, creating it all yourself. If you're going to do it all yourself, then may I recommend diving in wholeheartedly and creating the systems for it. You know, i.e. the gods, their backstories, how they affect the world, what people believe in them, you know. You can't just have a, a, a half-assed religion, I guess is the way you're putting it. Uh, but if, you're, if you don't want to go to that level, choosing a system that's already out there doesn't have to be Christianity. It can be Shintoism, Buddhism. It can be uh, Zoroastrianism, if you want, or something, you know. Uh, but the point is, is that... You know, as we were saying earlier, you've, you've got to create a core, you've got to surround that core with something, and you have to be respectful no matter what you do, because even if it's a f- made-up religion, it's still religion to people. And religion is, is such a part of us, it's such a foundation for people, that your characters are going to feel that way too. True. Jen and then Fedora? Um, uh, to go to the extreme of people who thought a whole lot about their mythology and backstory. We mentioned Tolkien briefly. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But Tolkien wrote a pen, you know, how how many appendices were stuck at the end of Return of the King? 50. In addition to (laughs) writing an entire lore Bible in the Silmarillion. Mm -hmm. Uh, he started he, with the creation of the world, and... He just worked just that yeah, way, yeah. Took us up to when Bilbo leaves his house. And technically... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, tec- and then afterwards, in the, in the Return of the King. Yes, uh, yeah, good point. Technically, the, uh, the, world, the world of Middle-earth is actually supposed to be real Earth. It's yes, just yes. what happened before this age started. So, technically, he's rewriting the beginning of our world with his lore. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought very, very deeply about all this stuff. I would almost say too deeply, because I think he was living in Middle-earth by the time he died. (laughs) Real quick, I think I'm going to turn it off the door. Just real fast with Middle-earth and Tolkien and so forth. Tolkien took his entire story, the Lord of the the Rings, the entire Ring of Power, from the same place that Richard Wagner took his um, ring cycle, and that is from one myth, or one saga, from the Viking saga, Vasgard the Vasalong and the Fall of the Nibelongans. It is, all of the stuff is based on Nordic myth. Say that to him. You just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I just, since you were throwing it out there, yeah, he basically took Norse myth and recreated it and created Tolkien. I think we might learn a lesson from Sinclair Lewis, who wrote El Megadre. It is a debunking of the evangelistic Mm -hmm. movement based on Amy Semple McPherson who was in the 30s and was an evangelist that did tent shows and was a really big person. Okay, the lesson is this, that he does not attack the religion ever. He only makes his characters bad (laughs) and vulnerable Uh and uh, brings them down. So I think you might be able to work along those lines in some fashion. Don't bring down the religion, bring down practitioners that are bad. Yes. yes. Dorothy Sayers in her in her Lord Peter Whimsey stories does a similar thing, not necessarily taking people down, but exploring different uh, modes of thought that were popular in the day. And her main character is an atheist, Lord Peter Whimsey. And his, his BFF police partner guy, um, which is totally not how they would ever say anything like that. They're proper. Um, <laughs> his uh, police ch- police officer chum. friend, Chum, <laughs> yes, they're British, chum. chum, is uh, Charlie Parker, 
and well, Charles Parker, whatever. And he is a Christian. So often when you'll see the two of them, or Lord Peter Wimsey runs into Parker, he's reading a book on theology of some kind that you won't necessarily know is theology unless you're familiar with it. And it informs his character a lot. Um, his worldview comes from that Christian viewpoint. Peter Wimsey comes from an atheist, but kind of very uh, altruistic, but secretly altruistic. <laughs> Secret is a big deal to Don't him. you dare catch him being altruistic. He, he runs a society for to give women jobs who are single, and it's in like the 20s. So single women, divorced women, it gets them money. It gives him mysteries to solve. But he will never tell you he's doing it to help anyone. Ever. Ever. <laughs> but he also, Sor Sayers also takes characters um, who were very legalistic or into eugenics mm -hmm. and gives those modes of thought to different people and explores where it takes you in the end. So she's very good at that. And... I think that's a good way of having religion and fiction. It does not inform the overarching plot of most of the stories, but it feeds into character, and it makes them all richer, more vibrant people for that. Yeah, I was, I'm going to butcher the name, but the four Cossackin books, because I can't pronounce the name of the author, but um, then there's a lot of different planets, and there are some different religions there, but... Um, one of them, technically the planet is not supposed to be religious, but they have these um, they have these rituals and their whole system of government and it's all about you know keeping your word at least in the theory should mean something and they burn offerings to the dead and it's almost like they have a they're, they almost have a religion of ancestor worship, but it's not quite formalized into that. But you can definitely see it going there. <laughs> and it's... I think going back to what Brad was saying earlier about playing with religions, creating your own, good idea is first study the religions that have already existed or mm -hmm. do exist, understand how they work, and then go from there. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think a good point related to that is also what Fedora brought up earlier. Um how religion informed a lot of the people, the, the culture here in St. Mm -hmm. Louis, for mm -hmm. one. Um, and the, the thing about the World's Fair being closed on Sundays just blew, blows my mind. Like, <laughs> it blew my mind. And that's not something that I would consider, you know, religion. That's a cultural effect that a religion had. So I think if, if something like that that affects so many people is just culturally built in. Mm -hmm. We should be mm -hmm. thinking more about how religions in our fiction affect the culture and what is built into these cultures that we're creating or that we're writing about that mm -hmm. are real. And, you know, we can't just ignore that entire chunk because, I mean, when I was writing the story, I was going to have, you know, every day because everything's open every day now. But, like, that would have been a glaring mistake, glaring mistake, to have people at the World's Fair on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, there were people there who, who mended the staff, yes. mended the buildings. Yeah. There I were people there, but not, be, nothing yeah. was open. That yeah. People cleaning up the right. yeah. That would be the, the reset day, I figured. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I was j a boxcar jilt, Truman, the very first one. Oh, the boxcar children. Yeah. Um, it just required, I was reading this to a first grade class. It was actually at an Orthodox Jewish school. And... Uh, the teacher said, oh, I don't think you're going to get to this point. Well, if you do, just kind of skip over it, whatever. And um, when I got to it, it was going to be, it was Sunday, and they were going, to, and the little girl was asking, oh, can we build a dam on Sunday? Can we build a dam to, on Sunday? Because they wanted to build a dam to dam up the stream so they could take a bath. Mm -hmm. But that's working on Sunday. Do you mean the set Saturday? The Sabbath. No, this was an Orthodox Jewish school, but I was reading the boxcar children. Oh. And the whole problem was their Sabbath is on Saturday, okay. and they were talking about Sunday. Oh, I'm sorry. I that's see. why I missed. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why she wanted me to, what I just said tomorrow, just, and it went. That was a good cover. It, it went right <laughs> over their heads. Frankly, when I read it as a little kid, it went right over my head. It's like, I never occurred to me that it wasn't allowed to work on Sunday, and that was the problem, uh -huh. you know. 
Yeah. Uh, I was just going to throw out Dune because we, you know. <laughs> we yeah. touched Dune briefly. Yeah, yeah, again and again. again. Do you but not because Zach's had her act this time. Drink, 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 get four. But I had to say it. Uh, so I'm actually going to throw out, like, the Benny Gesserit um, and the way we were talking about how they affect mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. The way in which uh, Dune is set up is that the Benny Gesserit are these um, priestesses. Uh, who, you know, are one of the dominant forces in the universe, um, and for good and bad. You know, they do good things, they do bad things. Um, however, they are highly... When the Kwisax Haderach shows up, uh, he screws with everything. <laughs> you should have had five uh, drinks by now. Go I ahead. know, I'm digging it. I'm going to get everybody drunk by the end of this episode. Yeah. That's my goal. Um, but anyway, um, the point being is that when he shows up, uh, and the Bene Gesserit and the, uh, uh, the Spicing Guild... Or the Spacing Guild, Spacing I should Guild. say. Um, <laughs> are, are, you know, really kind of thrown into turmoil because of everything that's going on. And he's able to exploit that. And it's used beautifully the way that, uh, you know, the way that religion is ingrained in their culture. And then the way one man can just flip that, uh, who comes in as the prophet and kind of rewrites everything. If you're looking for a great way that, you know, religion affects culture and how that can get, you know, just torn up. Uh, Dune's actually a really great way of doing it, especially if you keep going through the series. Because then, the Kwisak Haderach uh, totally starts to screw up <laughs> later on, and his children and everything, they have issues, and actually the religions end up flipping back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's, there's a really, there's a back and forth, and, it, and it, once you go through the whole series, you end up realizing, uh, kind of the whole point is that there's really no one way. Um, and that it is kind of this amalgam of all the different ways that ends up being how their universe uh, continues on. Um, It's a really interesting thing that is kind of a central feature of the Dune books. Mm -hmm. And along with that, with the Dune books, going back to an earlier question that Kathleen asked, what do you do when you find out that you became a demigod? Well, the quiz I've had Number seven. <laughs> seventh drink. Um, Somebody needs off, to get a Quizak Sadarak, let me tell hey, you. Hey, <laughs> I hope for you, Chad um, and David. First overthrows the cultural government. He takes control of what happens on Dune, he overthrows the galactic government, and then in the long run tries to outrun or get away from the future he sees coming. Yeah. And he, what he sees coming is a huge. Uh, Holy War. Holy War. Thank you. I'm trying to think of another word for it. The Holy War that is being raged in Crusade. his name. You don't want to use the other word. No, okay. I don't really want to. Because that would cause us to be on the NSA. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Anyway, oh. anyway he, gets, he gets that and then he goes off on his own and we see him come back trying to stop his own religion. Yes. And we, I'll just stop it right there. And I'll let you guys read the whole entire Dune series to find out what happened to the <laughs> quiz that happened. No, no. <laughs> well, actually, you don't have to read the entire series to find out what happened to him, because you also need to know what happened to his children. Yes. But that, that plays in. Children of Dune totally plays yeah. into him. God Emperor of Dune and all yeah, that. Yeah, all that kind of fun stuff. Mm-hmm. You can also watch the great miniseries that were on Siffy. Yeah, Siffy, Siffy, when they were still doing good sci-fi, which I know they're coming back to, did a fantastic thing of Dune and Children yeah, of Dune. Yeah, Dune and Children of Dune. Really good. And I'm a huge fan, actually, of the David Lynch Dune, too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't sc- shy... They kind of glossed over the whole siblings marrying, but, you know... Yeah, that's because they combined two books into one. Yeah. yeah. For the got, for Children of Dune. But still, it was a great movie. Mm-hmm. And it showed how the quiz that had rack. Yeah, if you worked. don't want to read, like, you know, 10,000 pages, then watching the two movies is actually a really good way. Yes. So, <laughs> now that we've talked about... Not number 10. <laughs> I wanted to bring it back to <laughs> writing fiction. Yes. Writing fiction and involving religion. And I, uh, can I bring that up? Jen? I guess so. It's not I, like anyone can go read it anywhere. <laughs> I'm really, really surprised because Jen is working on a novel that features religion yeah. prominently. And I was surprised you hadn't mentioned how you decided to go about writing it that way. Oh, well, uh, Threadcaster is my fantasy novel. It takes place not on this earth, so I can do whatever I want with it. Um, it's, uh, I wanted to have religion be, like, a big part of it, because I was thinking, um, 
uh, about uh, Judeo-Christian history, that there's a big spot in the middle between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God just pieces out for a while. Uh -huh. He just, just vanishes and leaves everyone with their own devices. And I'm like, well, what would happen to the world if God did that? So I wrote a story about a magic-based world in which God controls magic, and what happens when God pieces out for a while and just leaves people to use magic willy-nilly? And it became a really cool thing, because <laughs> when humans can use magic, they, of course, use it poorly. And it results in a lot of, uh, of damage to both person and property. So it was, uh, it was cool to, since it does have a certain, uh, I guess, Jewish sort of underlie to it, there's, a, you know, there's one God in charge of everything, uh, and specifically, I wanted to have God stay God, because there's only one God there. I thought it made really good sense that in a world that only had one God, that they wouldn't come up with some dumb name for him. Not that that's... I'm sorry for using the word dumb. Lots of great fiction is to give God name, but there's only one God. So I have I have a God, and he's in charge of everything. And he's currently on vacation, <laughs> which is great. One of the things that I like about your story is that you do have a religious order. And what people believe about this religious order and what this religious order knows about the truth are not always the same thing. Now, we're going uh, also taking a lot of inspiration from um, the, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of the word? Oh, no. It starts yes. with an R. Martin Luther. Oh, Reformation. Reformation, Reformation. thank you. Oh, goodness. It takes a lot of hints from the Reformation that the uh, the church is controlling the information going to the people because people don't have access to what's technically in my world like a Bible thing. Like they don't have access to the laws of the land, and they say, "Oh, the law says that you need to give us all of your wealth." Oh, okay. Well, if the law says that, I guess we got to do that. Then it's like the law says that only we can use magic powers. Oh, okay. I guess that makes sense because you guys have the law and we don't, so we will believe you. When the law actually says nobody use magic powers, they're actually not for you and you're going to ruin everything. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Oh. The book you can't read. <laughs> yeah, I was, um, I have a story that's first draft written, but one of the secondary characters is, uh, he, this book is taking place real world, but about a very distant future, like 50,000 years. And some version, some religion that's evolved from Mormonism exists. And um, there is an active debate in that religion whether where the home world of Mormonism is, whether or not it's on Earth or this other world where this other person comes from. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was actually just going to throw out another Margaret, actually uh, technically two other Margaret Weiss novels. Uh, the first one being The Deathgate Cycle, uh, which is a series of seven books um, but each of the seven books kind of focuses on a different world that uh, they travel to, and each one has its own kind of different setups and different things, and it's kind of the way in which the worlds interact with each other and the way in which almost deities and magical beings interact with each other. It's a really fascinating thing. Uh, and then her Dark Sword trilogy um, was kind of an interesting take mm -hmm. on how magic can kind of uh, infuse into things and... Uh, interesting ways, but anyway, I was just going to throw that out. There's not really enough time to kind of keep digging in. You can go on, Fedora. One of my favorite mysteries is the G.K. Chesterton series, Father Brown, and Father Brown is saving souls and solving crimes. <laughs> but it's it's the the percentage of which is which that I find mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Really, what he is allows him to be un nosy, busy body <laughs> and go around and solve crimes and ask people impertinent questions. Mm -hmm. But his actual saving of souls is quite a minuscule part of the mystery. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a matter of how much religion you put in it instead right. of anything else. Yes. I also think um, how you use religion to inform characters is very, very mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. I was playing a Phoenix Wright game the other day and there were two teachers in a school, one of whom, in, in a school teaching, people had to be lawyers. One of the teachers, his thing was the end justifies the means. Results, results, results. If you get the verdict you want, you've done well. By any means necessary. Next one, Go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the other teacher, the one who died, who was murdered, was the, the teacher who said, you know, how you do it is as important as what happens at the end you only get a verdict through, you know, being truthful and using honest means, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So 
those simple things informed how the characters treated everyone around them and how they went about their entire lives. And religion is a focal point for so many people and informs how they live their lives. And the differences in religion have an effect in how people treat other people and how they see the world. So if you're going to have religion in fiction, what David said about being <coughs> respectful of the religions that you use, if you're using real religions, is important. But it's also important to, to see what the core belief is of that character, whether it's religious or not, and to use that to inform everything they do. Religion doesn't have to be dominant in a story to be there, but I think it's a good thing for the author to know, whether it shows in the story directly or not. It's good to know your characters all the way through, and that's one aspect of character that feeds into how we act. And I think on that note, we'll finish this show. Because that's Hatterack. <laughs> okay and on that note um have a great week writing tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry and quiz that hatterack the new theme songs for right pack radio were written and performed by meredith tate all copyrights remain with her right pack radio would like to thank stl books for allowing us to record in their office STL Books is an online bookstore specializing in new and used high-quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.